Okay. Here we go. Good afternoon. The time is now 1.19 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education regular meeting of March 9th, 2021 is reconvened. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There is one individual who wishes to address the board and that individual is Lupe Ramos Montini, who is very aware of the rules as she's heard them for the past eight years. So uh, Lupe, are you there, Lupe Ramos Montini? I am, I am, good afternoon. Hi, as soon as you're ready, go ahead and provide your comments. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Well, I am here uh, for many reasons, but first of all, I wanna congratulate the two new board members I, and I wish you the best of, of luck as you maneuver through the educational system in the state of Michigan. You are in good hands with a wonderful staff and an outstanding superintendent. So I wish you all the best. And as you, as we continue, and, and hello, of course, to all the other board members that I work with. I know you're enjoying this day from inside, but I hope that you have a, a moment to go outside this beautiful day. But I am engaged now, of course, continue being engaged with the committee to honor Cesare Chavez. And what a responsibility I had as a state board member and you have now as uh, the existing uh, board, um, the, the aid board member, uh, so today with that responsibility, we have to make sure that all of our students receive the best education possible. And we have students in our school system where they are American citizens, but their parents are under documented. And I am coming here to talk about those parents who work in the field harvesting the crop, or they work in, in restaurants, washing dishes and doing those kind of a duties in that environment, or in um, meat markets or in greenhouses and many other jobs that Americans don't really want to do. Now this underdocumented uh, uh, workers that we have here in our country are many times um, not respected and, that, and not dignified. But we're very, very lucky that we had a man of humble beginnings that worked also in the field by the name of Cesar Estrada Chavez. Now this, he wasn't a, a tall person, a, he was a small man, but he had a strong conviction that he was going to organize the, the farm workers and he and Dolores Huerta were able to organize and establish the United Farm Workers. And the major things that they were gonna help them with were wages and housing. Now, during the pandemic, these workers were classified as essential workers. And they, uh, of course, were under the um, advice of the governor to social distance themselves. But if you know in the fields, they're side by side, the roads are right by side. So they really couldn't concentrate on exercising that recommendation. Also, we were recommended to wash our hands for 20 minutes, I mean, 20 seconds. And in the fields, you don't have a clean, clear uh, water to drink and much less to wash your hands uh, as often as, as was, was recommended. And also, of course, the mask were, was something that 
the face masks were recommended. But of course, uh, these workers that were classified as essential workers didn't have that luxury either. Now, they, as time progressed, uh, water probably was was intense, maybe, or uh, was uh, placed in the field and masks were given to them. Uh, however, these workers or the, or the workers that supply food at our tables uh, all the time, pandemic or no pandemic, we go to the store, there's piles of fruits and vegetables, and we have to understand that those came from the fields and somebody had to harvest those crops to get to the store. And I'm just gonna tell you one, we, everybody likes cilantro these days. That crop is harvested on their knees the whole day long because you know, uh, it grows low to the ground. And, but then we enjoy it here in the stores and then at our tables. So those are the people that I represent now, that I advocate for. And so on, on March the 31st, we are celebrating uh, the life and legacy of Cesar Chavez. Now, on December the 3rd, 2003, Governor Granholm signed legislation establishing uh, 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 March 31st as uh, the Cesar E. Chavez Day in the state of Michigan. And, and we were encouraged, and we are encouraged to observe that day for uh, our beloved le labor leader. Also, uh, as a board member on February the 11th, 2014, we passed a resolution to um, recognize that local education agencies determine curriculum and strongly encouraged the inclusion of lessons on Cesar Chavez is appropriately referenced in the grade level content expectations and high school content expectations in the social studies standards. So different people have put the markers uh, down. So so the school, so our children, and I'm not, when I say our children, I'm not talking about just these uh, students that, that pertain to these families. I'm talking about students throughout. Just like I, as a young uh, child in, in grade school and, and on up, learned that uh, uh, George Washington was the father of our country, we want our students to also learn about contributions from all different ethnic groups. And so it is very important for us to advocate that our students in the state of Michigan are also uh, instructed and, and also uh, uh, informed about people that contributed to the, to the growth of our country and to our state. Now, on December the, the I mean, uh, on March the 31st uh, of this year, the Committee to Honor Cesar Chavez, and I, I am hoping that you receive the invitation that I asked Marilyn to send to you by uh, email, uh, that, and we're gonna be celebrating Cesar's birthday. Now we understand there's a pandemic and, and, we, can, and, and we cannot have a live community gathering. This is a yearly annual event that we have here in Grand Rapids where the community literally comes together from all walks of life, whether it be an elected official, city official, uh, college president, university, every uh, community comes together. And so this year, as we lift ourselves uh, in the spirit of, of our students, we want to recreate this in a virtual presentation. And so this is how, where you come to play. Uh, I have invited you to participate and, and sent you the link where you can register. Uh, I'm hoping I get a thousand people uh, students and just adults, because this event is tailored for all learners of all ages. 
And we have to understand too that the life and legacy didn't belong or doesn't belong to any particular group. Asetha's legacy belongs to to the world. And there's uh, here in Grand Rapids we have a school named after after Cesar Chavez. And the latest big event that we were so excited about was when President Biden put he, a bust of Cesar Chavez in his Oval Office. You know, I, I come from a uh, 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 migrant farm working family when, when I traveled from Texas to, to Michigan to harvest the crop. And when we see something like that, at, of that magnitude, you know it, it stirs us up inside and, and gives us the hope that there is a, a, this big umbrella that people talk about. So, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, that you uh, uh, accept my invitation and, and you uh, register to participate on March the 31st from 10 to 11. And I'm also hoping that you encourage schools in your communities to engage their students to experience a, a si se puede spirit activity. And so I don't know if I ran out of time or I'm on time, but that's, that's my message for today. Unity in the community with a community gathering. So with that, I, I wish you all the best. I hope you have time to go enjoy the day and, and the best always to the State Board of Education. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, former board member Lupe Ramos Montini for your public comment. Um, we have no other individuals. If you could mute your, um, if you could mute your computers, if you're not speaking, that would be great. We're moving on. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of February 9th, 2021? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? No. Support. I have a, a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. Marilyn, if you could do a roll call vote, please. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Critchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, we're at the uh, point where we're at the report of the board president, Dr. Albrich. I just have a, a very quick report. Uh, Judy and I participated in NASB's Public Education Policies committee meeting uh, earlier. Well, I guess this was technically last month now. Uh, and both of us are working with one of the subcommittees to update some of the language and text around the uh, PEP guidelines uh, that you will see at if you attend the NASB legislative uh, meeting in October. Uh, so that work continues. And um, I just wanted to also congratulate the five districts, Benton Harbor, Detroit, Flint, Muskegon Heights, and Pontiac that are receiving the Michigan Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant. This is exciting news, and um, we look forward to uh, the great work that they're going to do with this grant. Thank you. Thank you, President Albrich. We're at the point where we uh, do report to the state superintendent. I would like to share for the board and the community just a few of the words that I shared at our building mirrors and windows conference on February 25th. You heard a little bit about that conference um, a few hours ago from Ms. Alice, Dr. Daniels, and Ms. Probe Still. Um, here are a few of those welcoming comments. We're here today because words matter and voices too. And in that spirit, I'd like to share the words from a voice that matters, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who coined the terms mirrors, children seeing themselves in their reading, windows, children seeing others in their reading, and sliding doors, children entering other worlds through their reading. 
Reading is so much more than technical skill. It's engagement with kids through the power of words. As literacy advocates, we know that words matter. As diversity in literacy advocates, we know that voices do too. It was Langston Hughes who wrote in Mother to Son, well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. And it was the same Langston Hughes who wrote, I too sing America. Words matter, voices too. It was Tupac who wrote, did you hear about the rose who grew from a crack in the concrete, proving nature's laws wrong? Words matter, voices too. It was James Baldwin who wrote, God gave no other rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. Words matter, voices too. It was Gil Scott Heron who wrote, I'm gonna take myself a piece of sunshine and paint it all over my sky. Be no rain, be no rain. Words matter, voices too. And it was Nikki Giovanni who wrote in Ego Tripping, I am so perfect, so divine, so ethereal, so surreal. I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. I mean, I can fly like a bird in the sky. Words matter, voices too. Words matter, voices too. What we read, who we read with children helps determine whether, how much, and with what passion our children too will read. This theme of what we read to our children, how we read to our children, what we share with our children is instrumental in the extent to which they will engage, not simply in reading and writing, but in the rest of their education as well. It is to relevance, it is to identity, it is to enjoy, it is to joy, it is to engagement, and it is ultimately to, um, to their rising. With that said, I'd like to turn to the report of the Michigan Teacher of the Year, Mr. Owen Bondano. Uh, the 2021 Michigan Teacher of the Year will present his report. Mr. Bondano is an English language arts teacher at the Oak Park Freshman Institute in Oak Park Schools. Ms. Sarah Soper, Region 8 Teacher of the Year, is joining us from Northwest Community Schools in Jackson. She is an English teacher at Northwest High School. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Teacher leaders, welcome. Hi, sorry, it took a moment for my mute to go away. <clears throat> uh, let me just share a screen real quick here with my presentation. There we go. Um, as was just introduced, I am, of course, Owen Bonano, the Michigan Teacher of the Year for this year, and I'm joined today by Sarah Soper, the Region 8 Michigan Teacher of the Year. So as we know, Come on, next slide, thank you. There we go. As we know, March is reading month and those quotes that were just shared by Dr. Rice were wonderful. I got maybe a little bit um, teary-eyed at some of them, the good selections, Dr. Rice. Um, and uh, in, in my room, I very much enjoy making March a holiday in my room. You know, I think February is a hard month to be a teacher. Um, that long gray month of February, I think leaves a lot of us feeling very tired and very, um, very much looking like the the end of the school year is in a far distant tunnel. Um, and so I like using March as an excuse to re-energize my classroom, to have a lot of fun competitions with my, my students about reading, um, to really bring to the forefront this idea of reading for fun. You know, there's there's a lot of reading we do in my class. Obviously, I'm an English teacher um, that is prescripted by me. But the idea that reading is a thing you do for fun is a thing that is important to emphasize for, uh, for student literacy. Um, so one of the things I ask my students to do is to compile over the course of the whole school year recommendations for their peers based on books that they've read. You know, what, what have they liked? Why have they liked it? We go over how you write a good book review. Um, and I especially emphasize that in March, where all students need to be giving me reviews of some of the books they've read. You know, they can go over to the binder re reviews to find their next book and so on. Um, so this year uh, we had to do a little bit differently since we're mostly online, um, but we still figured out a way to do some book reviews together. And so um, 
for March's Reading Month, I thought I would just choose a couple of my students' book reviews and recommendations for you in case you're looking to boost up your to reading list this month. So I've got four to share with you. The first one is from my student, Laranya, and she read Howl's Moving Castle, which you may have seen the movie, but she read the book. Um, and an excerpt from her review or recommendation says, I love the movie, but the book is so much better. Sophie, the protagonist, is equally powerful to Howl in the book. It's not just about love, it's about equality and choosing your own destiny. You should read this book if you like the movie or any other magical fantasy books, or if you're a feminist like me. So that's a great one to put on your list if you haven't read it already. Uh, Mariah would like to recommend Coyote America by Dan Flores. She says, I didn't read nonfiction books until this year, but this one surprised me. It's about how coyotes and humans have lived together for thousands of years. It made me think about my connection to all humans and our shared past. You should read this book if you like animals, nonfiction, history, or true crime. It's not true crime, but it reminds me of some true crime shows, so I thought that fit. Um, and on a personal note, I have just started this book myself, actually, based on her recommendation, and so far it is very good. Um, the third book from Melvin is Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. This book has, has a lot of Spanish in it, but don't let that scare you. Even if you're not Latinx, the family and characters in the book will feel like your family. At least they felt like mine. The book also does a good job with the gay and trans characters. The book makes all the magic in it feel like a normal part of the world, and the characters' identities feel normal too. They were relatable, even if you're not the same as them. And our last recommendation is Miles Morales Spider-Man by Jason Reynolds, which is recommended to you by Cameron. Do you like superheroes? Doesn't matter, read this book. Yeah, it's a Spider-Man. It's about Spider-Man, and if you like him, there's plenty of web slinging. Don't like Spider-Man? No problem. This book is about Miles Morales, an Afro-Latino teenager who is struggling to balance what his family expects of him, what the world needs him to do, and what he wants. Spoiler alert, the villain Spider-Man has to fight in this one is racism. Sort of. Just read it. I hope that you will pick up one of the four books my students have recommended to you and celebrate this month with a lot of reading just for fun. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Soper of Region 8. So this is hilarious because I was not um, I did not see any of the presentation beforehand. I did not see that Owen was going to be talking about reading. I didn't see that it was going to be about the doors and windows. And I feel like Dr. Rice basically was quoting off of my last slide on here. So um, English, this is an English teacher explosion <laughs> today that we're giving to you. Um, so I am from Northwest High School, which is a high school in Jackson, Michigan. And um, I've been there 16 years. This is my 16th year, hardest year I've ever had in my life. Um, so I'm just taking it day by day and hoping to get through it. Um, you can go to the next slide, Owen. And I have, I had to put my family in here because other than teaching being my passion, I'm passionate about my family. So um, that's my husband, Adam. We've been married for 15 years. And then Quinn, who's the boy who's in fifth grade and Reese, who's the girl, both are gender neutral names. So I have to clarify who's the girl who's in fourth grade um, and they're best buds. So I'm lucky, we'll, we'll see if it stays. Go ahead on. All right, so this is me. Um, once again, as you can see, some um, books are in <laughs> the mix here. Um, I'm department chair of the English department. I think I've been that for five years now, maybe six. I'm Link Crew advisor, which what Link Crew is, is it is a group that helps freshmen transition into the high school. So of course, this was last year, this one, not um, where we're not wearing masks. And then this year, we tried to at least do a small, we're calling it the Compass Crew, um, just to at least help freshmen get around the building. Um, we started a new trimester today and we had freshmen coming. We've been face-to-face -face, um, by choice or they could be virtual since day one, but we had some students who are now opting to come back. And so we have freshmen who have literally never sent root set foot in our building. Um, so these kids are still helping them transition. It's it, The role has looked a little different this year, but it's still a really important role in our school building. Um, I teach a lot of different classes, but I mostly teach ninth grade and senior AP Lit. Um, 
I also have some electives. I have a um, fun class that I like to teach called Books to the Big Screen, where we read um, books that have been adapted into movies, and then we watch the movie. So the kids like the class, and it gets them to read too. Um, so that's just that's just me and my work. You can go ahead. And then points of pride. So I. I'll start with the award first. I won the excellence in education, actually um, the same school year, like it was the end of the school year that I got that. Um, that one um, did give me $1,500. Regional Teacher of the Year did not. <laughs> Just kidding, because <laughs> people are always like, what's your award for this one? Because they saw me with a big check and I'm like, I get to talk. <laughs> that's my award so but it's great I'm so so thrilled to be part of this um, and I am an AP reader so what that means is I go um, in June or now we are virtual so I'll be at my home in June and I grade essays for seven days straight um, my best year so far I graded 1125 essays in seven days um, which is the national AP test um, so it's it's a pretty big deal and then of course it helps my students too so and then i've also presented at the national conference um sorry the national council of teacher of english conference um i did it on teach living poets which i'm going to talk a little bit about in the next slide so as i mentioned it's really interesting of all these things that came up because i seriously had a couple little notes and they were very similar <laughs> to what has already been talked about today. Um, because my passion is with literacy, obviously being an English teacher, but specifically, and this has happened a lot through Nerd Camp Michigan, which is a um, um, Colby Sharp, who's from Jackson. He um, started it he had, with Donalyn Miller. If you know Donalyn Miller, she's a um, pretty um, well-known author. And um, this kind of helped me to gain my passion back for young adult literature and really for literature in general. Um, and that just kind of made it more important for me for students to have access in my room and basically it just changed my world and now um, it's changed my classroom also and it's funny because the I wanted to go to the literacy conference I wasn't able to because we were in our last week of the trimester but the the building windows and mirrors is a, a metaphor that I've used often because my main thing is I'm trying to always build my classroom bookshelf to have um, a book where any kid can pick it up and relate. Um, so any kid should have one book or hopefully more that they relate. So I've been trying to get um, more and more diversity. I think I'm up to about 800 personal books in my classroom library. Um, and so I'm continuing to grow. I've gotten a few grants and um, you know some donations and things, but a lot of it comes just from me. Um, and it's just really important that access piece is important too because when you have a reluctant reader especially like my ninth grade boys um if i can put something in front of them and say hey just try this miles morales or just try this um this long way down also by jason reynolds who all the boys love um then they will oftentimes read and i've had a lot of kids say to me that my class was the first time they read a book. Um, they, we get our hands on them. Usually it's different during COVID, but we get our hands on them. They do book speed dating and they try to find things that they like. And then the last little thing is Teach Living Poets. It's a hashtag. You can look it up. It's pretty, um, pretty well known at this point. This is actually my friend Melissa that I'm in um, the top picture with, along with Elizabeth Acevedo, who was the National Book Award winner um, a year or two ago. And um, Melissa is the one who started it, but that's what I helped present with. And the cool thing about teaching love and po poets is I teach AP Lit, which um, more, about half of the test is on poetry. So it's really important that students analyze poetry. But in the past four or five years that I've been teaching living poets, students have enjoyed it more. Um, we do blogs and we interact with other students. Um, a lot of times we'll put tweets out and the poets themselves will interact with us. And it's been, they're finding connections because there's poems about current 
issues. There's poems about Black Lives Matter. There's poems about transgender issues. There's poems about all of these things that are going on that for kids, that's important. And I've had so many kids say that like that has changed them. Um, this is um, the middle picture. The large picture is us actually Skyping with Clint Smith. He's actually getting to be quite famous as well. He just um, came out with his second book. And um, we were able a couple of years ago to Skype with him and he talked about all of our, um, all of his processes in writing his book and just the things that, um, you know, my students had great questions about writing poetry and he was able to come up with that. So that's really it about me. Um, hope we didn't bore you too much with all of our Englishy talk, but um, it is March's Reading Month and it is something not only that I'm passionate about, but that I've seen truly change the lives of some of my students. And so um, I think it's a good thing. Thank you to our teacher leaders. So appreciative of Mr. Bondano, Ms. Soper, and, um, and your leadership in the classroom and outside of the classroom. It's helpful for our board and by extension our community to hear and see your reflections um, on young people and what we need to do to engage them. That's really, really critical. A lot of what we do is um, um, at, at 10,000 feet, if you will. And, um, and yours is, is grounded. We appreciate that. It, it's important to have both perspectives to, uh, to do our work. So thank you. Thank you very much. Board members, uh, we're moving on in the agenda. The next item on today's agenda is the evaluation of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. President Albrich will lead this discussion. Thank you. Before that, I just wanted to make a comment uh, about our Teachers of the Year um, and how much I really appreciated uh, their comments uh, about March's Reading Month. I'm always looking for great book recommendations, so I love the idea of having students recommend books to each other. Um, we didn't do something like that when I was in school, and I, I think that would have been great. So kudos to you for thinking outside of the box to get students uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer level to uh, encourage each other to read. So that's great. Thank you. Um, moving on in the agenda. So uh, every March, the State Board of Education engages in an evaluation of the state superintendent. Um, contractually, the evaluation is due by April 1st. And so uh, today we, we did that. The agreement between the board and Dr. Rice stipulates that based on the satisfactory or above annual performance evaluation of the state superintendent, the agreement shall be extended by one year, making the new ending date July 31st, 2024. So I will make a motion and then uh, once it's second in, we can open up for conversations and I'll have additional comments to make. So the motion is pursuant to the agreement between State Board of Education and Dr. Michael Rice, Superintendent of Public Instruction, the State Board of Education has engaged in an annual evaluation of Dr. Rice and has found his performance to be uh, satisfactory um, or above, I would say. Um, that is my motion. Support. So it has been uh, moved and supported uh, so I will just share what my comments were um, for the most part uh, during the evaluation. Uh, I think overall the evaluation had a lot of really positive remarks uh, to share with Dr. Rice um, and, and obviously some um, additional comments uh, to think about for future. Um, so from my perspective, I just want to remind everybody that Dr. Rice started his tenure as state superintendent on August 1st, 2019. So if you think about that and you do the math, uh, seven short months later, we found ourselves in the worst public health crisis that this country has seen in at least 100 years. And, um, you know, earlier today he was talking about it's been... Um, at least uh, a year since we met in person for the last time and following our last March meeting uh, is when Michigan began to see COVID cases. So we've all been forced to do our work very, very differently. And that of course uh, definitely impacts the state superintendent as well as all of the employees at the Michigan Department of Education under Dr. Rice's leadership. Once the pandemic hit, um, the department uh, really, the productivity has been, in my opinion, pretty amazing. Uh, the department jumped right in 
and uh, under Dr. Rice's leadership, provided numerous guidance documents to local districts, uh, worked on federal waivers that allowed a, a number of different things to happen, helped schools provide food and assistance to students and families within days, literally, of going uh, remote, and is now helping to get kids back into the classroom. At the same time, the work continued, uh, the, the, the normal quote unquote work. Uh, so the department has updated the strategic plan with actual metrics, uh, is focusing on student achievement. And uh, as we saw today, just with the literacy piece, many of the metrics are heading in a much better direction than we've been, despite the fact that we are in an extremely challenging year uh, and, and have really had to rethink a lot of what we do. So my personal comment is I really appreciate the leadership that Dr. Rice has provided. Um, I, I think that he has done a very good job of keeping the board informed. Uh, he's addressed any concerns that I have brought before him. He and I speak, uh, I've mentioned this a at least a couple times a week, um, and I, I never have to feel like I'm being uh, going to be surprised by anything that happens. Um, so. I just want to say how much I appreciate Dr. Rice and thank him for um, sticking it out in one of the worst situations imaginable and continuing with his his leadership. Um, so those are my comments and I, I welcome comments of the rest of the board members. Well, since everyone is so shy, I will jump out here. <laughs> um, you know, there we are in a strange time. Um, and so, you know, not only were we looking at a pandemic, uh, a global pandemic um, that we've learned so much more about since a year ago, um, we were also in the uh, uprising as a result of uh, the George Floyd case and, and other cases. And so um, we're at this very pivotal moment in time and we've still been able to, you know, continue to move forward. And our children have definitely been at the center of our conversations. I do recall a year ago and I remember having the conversations with Dr. Rice. I remember um, right before the first cases, having the conversations about the uh, instruction and the guidance that was being provided to the schools. There was a time when we were given schools uh, instruction on how they could disinfect desks um, and clean off desks and making sure that they had the custodial staff to do that. And I remember having the conversation with Dr. Rice saying, ah, I don't think that that's quite going to be it. I think we need to give um, uh, uh, educators the um, that thought that they may have to shut down schools. And when you think about what that looked like, none of us could imagine what that was going to look like. Um, and for Dr. Rice to have that conversation, and I remember the following day, or maybe I think it was the following day, we had the conversation where it, I'm talking to Dr. Rice and I'm telling him the NBA just shut down. The uh, in um, the, the college basketball, well, first college basketball said that they weren't going to have anyone in the stadiums. And then I remember telling him, uh, hey, I'm CNN's on now. NBA has shut down. And at that time, it was also being called a pandemic. And I, I say all that to say that someone who's so focused on educating children, that me, public, I get public health and I've worked in um, the H1N1 crisis, I've worked in Flint, you know, just those few things have helped me to better understand how much of an inconvenience these things can be. And it's hard to be able to pivot and get your mind off of the norm and making sure that our children are in classrooms and are being educated. Um, but when you think about just all of those changes that were taking place so quickly, um, so to be able to, to get that and move with that, but also to have to uh, steer a department and steer um, a whole education system, that's a lot. I mean, in taking, uh, taking information from all different uh, angles and viewpoints, 
um, but then also to set forth a course to strategize and make sure that we're looking towards the future and putting forward a, a strategic plan. Um, so that's a lot. It's very difficult for people to understand this virus that we're dealing with because, you know, we think of it as um, single, just one single person. But this is a virus that whatever I do could impact multiple, multiple, multiple people. So it's not just about um, the fact that I can go in and I can be safe, but we have to also think about the, the transmission that um, when, when one person moves about what that, how that impacts so many other people. And I've found, it, found that it's very difficult for people to wrap that around their head, even at this time, even with the, the millions of, of, of people impacted uh, by this disease. And so I just um, would like to say that, you know, I, I, we appreciate your service at this time. Um, and, you know, there's so much more that, that we want to do and move forward for our children. And I know that we will get there, uh, but getting past this huge, horrific time that we find ourselves in says a lot uh, to be at the, at the helm of, of the education system at this time. Thank you, Pam. Judy? Thank you. Um, and I, I certainly echo Cassandra and Pam's comments and just wanted to add that um, leadership matters. And leadership matters probably the most during difficult times. Uh, since um, our English teachers got us thinking about books, I got thinking about one of my favorites, Tale of Two Cities. Uh, it is the worst of times and it is the best of times. And I think I switched those around. Dr. Rice probably remembers that line better than I do. But um, it has been both. Uh, Cassandra is right. Um, August 1st, 2019, a new beginning um, started talking about implementing or, or redoing the strategic plan or looking at it. Um, and smack dab in the middle of that process, along comes a pandemic that um, none of us obviously wanted, and there was no roadmap on how to follow it. Uh, and we needed to, at that point, have a leader who would continue to focus on what is happening with the schools, how can we support our students, how can we support our families, uh, what do we need to think about next, how do we react to that. How do we react to changes in uh, policies or directives coming from not only public health, but from legislation, uh, not only at the state level, but the federal level? Um, the experience that Dr. Rice brought to the table at the beginning uh, has certainly helped uh, during this time, but I want to personally thank him for leading us for being that steady voice. Um, there have been difficult decisions. There's no question about it. Um, the districts are overwhelmed. Um, they are making difficult decisions minute by minute sometimes, depending on what their community is facing at that point. Um, and yet we needed a steady person at the helm and Dr. Rice has been that individual um, in my opinion. So I want to thank him for that. I also want to thank him for pushing us to remember that we did have a strategic plan and that we do need to keep forward thinking because at some point this will be over. Um, and it's going to be different and our education system should be different, not massively different, but different in the way that we uh, teachers teach and students learn. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that journey, and I am pleased that Dr. Rice will be leading us that way. So that's uh, my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I don't see anyone else in the chat. I know not everyone has access to the chat, so I'll yeah. just open up. any other comments. Tom? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'll be voting no. Uh, I don't think the, the um, performance this past year by Dr. Rice has been satisfactory. I think it um, 
particularly, uh, well, I mean, it started off back when um, there was a need for him to make a decision on seat time waivers so that people understood seniors, were they going to get to graduate? Was there going to be, would, would uh, the non, or the um, uh, instruction that was going to be done uh, through the internet, virtual instruction, was that going to count? Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of angst, and so that was uh, early on. That decision should have been made. It could have been made by him, um, and there's plenty of, uh, of uh, legal folks that believe that that's the case as well. Um, but also, really just, um, I, I think that there was a need for him to advocate for in-person uh, and for sports. I think uh, that he dropped the ball on this. The CDC has made it clear, uh, and I've brought it up, uh, numerous times I'm looking at their website that uh, for for children uh, the uh, COVID is less harmful than the flu. Uh, this was uh, something the CDC has said and has not retracted that. Uh, the CDC also, and I have uh, have the statistics very clear, said that um, you know people that are 50 or younger, um, which is about uh, three fourths of the of the teachers, they uh, they have less likelihood of dying from COVID than dying in a car accident. So teachers, uh, there are plenty of teachers. Some of them obviously have comorbidities, uh, but if there was a will to really advocate for this, now I know that Dr. Rice couldn't make law, uh, but he certainly could have pushed and been very aggressive at um, you know, trying to do what I think student, what would have been best for students and for parents. Um, and that would have been for advocating for not just in-person uh, instruction, uh, but also for uh, for sports uh, to really, you know, stand up against uh, the governor's uh, overreach of authority uh, that was harmful to children. Um, also, I had I had been asking uh, publicly as well as privately for him to really push for uh, options for parents. Uh, there were a lot of parents scrambling and wanting to do things at home, to get together, to hire uh, somebody to teach, to work with a district, and you know there were there were barriers and there was just uh, things that needed to be overcome. There needed to be leadership and, and provide options for parents, um, and there just there was a lack of that. Um, I did not. I was took very strong offense to his. Uh, interest in tracking homeschoolers uh, that he's been making and pushing here recently. Um, I I know that it's 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 phrased in just want to count them, but I've seen things that uh, it you know we just want to do this, but then government ends up doing uh, quite a bit more, and and so I know homeschoolers are very concerned about that as well. And then you know the Open Meetings Act that that meeting I I, I was not very happy with how that got canceled, which I. I think uh, there was no authority to cancel, and I think that was acknowledged later. Um, but uh, we did end up having a, a, a meeting canceled. So I, uh, I've been disappointed. Um, I know that there are districts that are struggling to find to get teachers that will come into classrooms. Um, but you know, I think that um, there could have been also advocacy to try to, to get teacher uh, to try to get options, just more options. If that's what's needed. Let's come up with more options and and really do what kids need and what parents need. So um, for those reasons, I'll be voting no and, and would uh, we'll be making a motion also to not extend the contract. Thank you. Nikki. Yes, I would echo much of what Tom just said, including tracking homeschoolers, but that's a that's a debate for another day. I, I'd just like to include the um, I'll read the responses that I wrote um, in his uh, physical evaluation. Um, I expressed, given the opportunity to encourage sustained engagement of educators and students at the most imperative moments during our pandemic, which is directly associated with improved early literacy and the gap that widened as a result of the pandemic, as well as the springboard for all other items listed here in this evaluation. You didn't use the power or position you had to urge the highest possible participation of all student groups. At one point, calling anyone focused on this from the beginning, rabid individuals. I am deeply disturbed 
by that comment. Another comment I wrote was while our board passed an anti-bullying statement to encourage health, safety and wellness of learners in the past year, we acknowledge the importance of this happening professionally with educational leaders. Yet you have sat idly by while multiple board members boldly act unprofessionally, inappropriately, and in a diplom undiplomatic fashion. It won't matter how you attempt to lead learners if you are not able to lead the adults that are the example to our learners. I feel very passionate about uh, the issues that have come before us and the things that maybe we should have reconsidered uh, since the quarantine and very passionate um, about how we move forward. And really to echo your literary spirit today, words matter and voices too. And so regardless of how we move forward, I think I think that really needs to be addressed, those two things. Um, and I would uh, I'd be voting no on, on this initial motion and also seconding Tom's to not extend your contract. Any other comments? Yes, uh, this is. Yes, go ahead. This is member Tilly. I just want to say I um I definitely appreciate your your leadership. Um, this has not been easy for any of us. This pandemic, um, we have not seen anything like this in our lives, and it has drastically. Um, changed our education system. You have stepped up to the plate and you've been on point. You know, I think the majority of people, if you look at Detroit Public Schools right now, they're returning to schools, but 20 to 30 percent of the teachers um, are only returning. The rest of the teachers don't want to return to the classroom. People are still in fear and it's a real fear. This is not a made up fear. We have data, we have numbers. Um, you know, we've had outbreaks at numerous schools across the state. So we know that this is something that is real. So I, I appreciate you, um, you being there. At, at one point, you were literally updating us every single day about what was going on, <laughs> play by play. And um, you kept us engaged. Um, you kept us updated and you, you kept the rest of the state updated. You worked really well with the governor's office um, to try to to handle this situation that the, the best that you could. And I think somebody said earlier that if, there's no instructions to this. This has not happened in our lifetime. Um, and in recorded history, I don't think the world has seen a pandemic to this degree. So so um, just trying to deal with it the best that you you could. I think you made some really good decisions and you kept your grace about it, even even under attacks. And I appreciate that. So thank you. Any additional comments? Jason? Yes, I'll, I'll make a comment, you know, as a newbie to this board, Ellen and I, you know, I, I appreciate all that Dr. Rice has been able to do. Um, I, as we said in our closed session, I, I talked about education is is close to health in this global pandemic. That's one thing that is common in this diverse world we all live in. You know, it's it transcends race, orientation, social economic background, re religion, wants, needs, likes, all those things. Everybody has a a, a, a desire to be healthy and everybody has a desire to educate themselves and their children, everyone on this planet. So this is was a, in the fog of war during this global, global pandemic. There's going to be decisions that have to be made that history will only be able to tell if it was the right decision. You know, did we go left or right? And did we change? You know, but the constant updating throughout a pandemic and it shows leadership. The ability to be nimble with a a department that's as big as it is here in the state of Michigan. You're talking millions of students, teachers, and the like. It's not an easy job, but I think, and I've seen, and you can hear now, um, you did, you've done a fantastic job. I think the trajectory of of what where we're going is up. 
and that's all you can ask for. And uh, I, I really appreciate you. I really feature, appreciate your openness to the, the board, new board members like myself and Ellen, and, and all the way to President um, Albrecht. So thank you. Um, and if we have a vote, I, I definitely will be voting yes to keep you. Thank you, Pam. Um, this may be apparent to most, but I, I think that I need to say this. Um, Dr. Rice, nor the Department of Health and Human Services, nor Governor Gretchen Whitmer caused COVID-19. They've responded to it. <laughs> and, you know, when we look at just recently, uh, when in November, wow, it was November, that we shut down for uh, or, or did the pause, and we had 70% uh, decline in cases uh, and our hospitalization rates went up. Uh, there's another thing that I probably should say that I don't wanna assume everyone understands. COVID-19 and the virus that causes COVID-19 has not gone away. A matter of fact, it's strengthening. And so I just think that we just, those are some things that we just all need to just make sure that we're on the same level of thinking on, uh, that it wasn't caused by anyone here um, and that it is not gone away. And so, and, and just one more thing is that there are some communities that if we move, the more we, all communities, the more you move, the more that it's going to uh, spread. The last I looked, I'm sure we've moved up since then, we were at 11% of people who have been vaccinated. Um, that was 2%, a little bit above 2% for African American communities. I can't speak to the other, um, some of the other communities. I think it was at 6% for, for white, uh, uh, persons that have been vaccinated. So we're not immune to this disease that's spreading and, and it continues to spread. So I just wanted to, to just say that and add that to the conversation context. Thank you. Ellen. Yes, just a quick reflection on the process. Um, the, as every board member knows, our constitutional obligation is to um, appoint a state superintendent and set policy. Um, that's, that, has, that has been done. Um, and the, uh, the policy uh, as encompassed uh, prior to my uh, being on the board is of course embodied in the state strategic plan, the state strategic plan um, that we hear um, information on. Um, in terms of uh, evaluation, uh, it, I would urge board members to um, look at the metrics um, that uh, you asked yourselves, um, and now that Jason and I are on the board, we ask ourselves to be measured on um, and uh, look at uh, growth in those, in those areas. Um, a performance evaluation is not... Um, um, a, an index of happiness um, with the general order of things. Uh, I think we can all agree that that education in the form of a pandemic is uh, a, a most acute challenge. Um, but again, I would urge the board members um, to look at the factors uh, upon which we have asked the state superintendent to be evaluated on as evidenced by the state, state strategic plan to carefully look at the metrics by which those um, factors should be measured and look for um, growth and improvement in those areas. Um, parenthetically, I will say that uh, uh, a majority of the board um, believed each took those factors into consideration and believed that Dr. Rice performed um, not just satisfactory, which is required by the, uh, the contractual language, but well in excess of satisfactory. Um, and uh, uh, again, please be aware of process and procedure um, because that is uh, the way upon which the state is asking for us to work and uh, 
you know, improve the educational opportunities for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no additional comments, Marilyn, will you call the roll, please? Yes, as soon as I unmute here. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? No. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrecht? Yes. 6-2 motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to, um, to not extend uh, the superintendent's contract. We have a uh, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion on the motion. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Obrich. Not only does this motion violate the language of the contract, uh, but I feel that it is completely inappropriate uh, in the fact that it's clear that the majority feels uh, strongly that Dr. Rice uh, has done a very good job in the face of unbelievably challenging circumstances. And uh, I, I certainly would not be supportive of this, uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, I think we need to really think about the, the long-term ramifications of doing something like this, um, not only in the fact that it is, is a violation of his contract, but uh, in my opinion, a violation of his, the language of his contract, um, but also could certainly impact in the future. Uh, at some point, Dr. Rice might want to retire and we want, might want to bring on a new superintendent and votes like this uh, undermine our future uh, in our ability to attract good talent uh, and uh, I would just caution that there are there are serious ramifications all around of of uh, meaning uh, essential what is essentially a you know exercise in futility. Thank you, uh, Mr. McMillan. Yeah, I would just say that this is exactly what the contract calls for. The contract says his uh, contract is extended a year, unless, quote, unless the state board votes to the contrary. So this vote is uh, exactly what the uh, what the contract calls for. So I don't know what the previous comments were talking about. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. And further, just the spirit of consent of the governed. We are all elected public officials. We're meant to come to the board table and do precisely this work. It's not an exercise in futility. I'm very concerned that if you think this is an exercise of futility, um, about what you even, how you value the consent of the governed to begin with. Because if Tom and I can't come to the board table and have this discussion without being considered the things that you've just discussed, what what purpose would it be for us to have ever been elected and be here at this table? Um, it's okay. It's okay for us to to have experienced this, to voice it, for it to be factual and evidence backed and based. It's it's not an exercise in futility. It's an execution of the due diligence that we were elected to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, hearing and seeing no other interest in comment, uh, Marilyn, if you would be kind enough to take a roll call vote. Lipton? If, you, no. if you'd like to, just, just to be clear, the, the vote is a vote not to extend the contract. Okay? Um, Marilyn Schneider, to you. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Snyder? Y yes. Strayhorn? No. Tilly? No. 
Albrich. No. Two, six, motion fails. Thank you very much. Next item on today's agenda is the approval of request to change the name of Lewis Cass Intermediate School District to Heritage Southwest Intermediate School District. Section 380.604 of the revised school code requires that an intermediate board of education obtain the approval of the state board of education prior to adopting a distinctive name. The Lewis Cass Intermediate School District Board of Education voted to rename the Intermediate School District Heritage Southwest Intermediate School District and approval from the State Board of Education is being requested during today's meeting. Our presenter is uh, Mr. Kyle Garant. Mr. Garant, uh, what additionally do you have to share with us on this um, name change? Thank you, Dr. Issa. I think the only thing I'd like to add was just that the um, the ISD over the last six months has worked with um, the community uh, to consider their question of renaming the ISD. They formed a community a work group to explore this issue, um, and uh, that community group ultimately made a recommendation to change the name uh, and brought that recommendation back to the Lewis Cass ISD board um, for consideration and approval. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Garant. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? If not, hearing none, if I could have a motion to accept the name change as approved by the Intermediate School District. So move. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, Marilyn, if you'd be kind enough to um, do a roll call vote, please. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Chris? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. The next item on today's agenda is the state and federal legislative update. Mr. Martin Ackley, our director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, will begin this presentation, followed by uh, Ms. Lipton, our chairperson, and finally, Dr. Pritchett, um, our uh, representative to the National Association of the State Boards of Education. Mr. Ackley, to you to begin. Thank you, Dr. Rice. The uh, Legislative Committee, State Board Legislative Committee met on March 2nd. Um, we discussed some legislative items. Much of the discussion um, revolved around the resolution that the board adopted this morning, uh, and then also um, discussion on the budget that uh, Deputy Superintendent Garant discussed this morning. There is a bit of news. I just got a press release uh, from the governor's office um, that she did sign the supplemental uh, budget bills and vetoed House Bill, I think it's 4048, 4049, which was the tie bar bill. So that uh, she, because in her press release, she said it, because it's been 48 days from when she proposed the supplemental to when it was given to her that she felt an urgency to uh, sign the supplemental bills, but also veto the tie barred bill and then she's also directed the state budget director david masseron uh and mr masseron has has opened himself to any meeting with the legislature before by this friday because the legislature goes on break in two weeks and the governor would like to get everything wrapped up like to get all the federal dollars appropriated so that districts i mean so that departments can can use the money um to benefit the state of Michigan. Um, so that's still in discussion. And I'm not sure if Brandy Johnson is still on the call. She kind of um, referenced this this morning in, in a few comments that she has more detail on this, um, but that's basically the detail that I know. Mr. Ackley, to your, to your point, and we appreciate that update, to your point, Ms. Johnson is not with us currently. Okay. She had to step off the, um, step off the call, step out of the meeting. Um, but we appreciate your update. 
board members, any questions of uh, Mr. Ackley? So was that, so the veto, was it, was it the tie bar to the health departments yes. for the closure? And then did it also include the, uh, by March 22nd, the 20 hours? Were, were those together or separate? That was separate, 40, that was 4048. She just vetoed 4049. Okay, so 4048 is still there, the the 20 hours by. Yes. She did oh. sign, she did sign uh, House Bill 4048 and 4047, the two supplemental bills. So yes, so yes, both bills got signed. And she also mentioned that um, when the legal review of this bill's budget boilerplate is completed, the governor will direct state departments to implement this legislation consistent with constitutional requirements. So I think they are still reviewing the boilerplate uh, that were in those supplemental budgets. Um, and that is going to be included in these further, hopefully further conversations between the legislature and the uh, governor's office and the state budget office. Okay. So just to be clear, what we talked about earlier today, what all, sounds like coercion is still there, but that would be what would be under review. Right, right. She felt, according to the press release, she felt the urgent need to sign these bills, to sign the budget bills, to get the money flowing, what, they, what has been um, appropriated and now signed into law. And then the discussions are going to continue for an update, another supplemental to come through to, you know, to spend the rest of the federal dollars. And that's that's all I have, Doctor. Just uh, just one additional note on that: the um, the legislation which the governor was considering uh, signing into law would have required the authority over closures to devolve to local public health officials. The local public health officials as an association did not want that authority. That's an important thing to understand. That's different from other local decisions um, where local leaders have welcomed those opportunities. This is a different story. It's a different moment. It's a different circumstance. And these local leaders these local public health officials did not welcome that authority at all and felt that that authority properly should rest with the state um, in, in this sort of circumstance in a pandemic. So I wanted to be clear about that because oftentimes you end up, not you end up, but one ends up looking at a world through a political prism. But most local public health officials don't view the world similarly. They view the world through a public health lens and what's best for public health. And the local public health officials outside of that uh, political lens had a very different perspective. I wanted to share that. Um, Ms. Snyder to you for a comment and a question. Um, and just just sort of a short response to what you um, just said. I, I appreciate the concept of, of understanding that difference, but still back to ho the whole idea of governed by um, those who give their consent. So I mean, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear uh, about that in the coming months um, and in our future of what that means and looks like on the whole. Um, Marty, I have a question for you and a couple of comments just about the Open Meetings Act bill that was moving through. I, I think when I went back and read that, it looked more like it was a bill um, still rooted in how to handle online meetings for whatever reason um, during the pandemic or, in, or through July of, of, of some kind. So my comments are related to uh, holding meetings or allowing uh, the public body to participate in meetings in general via online as we move forward. And the only reason why I continue to bring this up is because even through our conversation when we talked about our bylaws and now just looking at that bill, it doesn't 
hold the truths that we've we've known about how viruses work or how people with low immune systems work or everything we've kind of talked about during the pandemic is is what does it mean for um, members of the public, public officials, teachers, students, family members to engage in their surrounding life in the way that it's safest for them? Because um, even when COVID is not something we'll call a pandemic, uh, we will always have viruses and bacteria that we don't have vaccines for. And we will always have people who are dealing with uh, low immune systems. So with that said, my curiosity is, is there any discussion legislatively um, or how can our board encourage that discussion well beyond the pandemic? And so that's just one question. But then the second question would be, um, how do we as a board start to move forward in the way that we meet? Because I think that we can start to meet in person um, according to the data that we have have really acquired over the last year. Uh, last month when I presented the hundreds of doctors and mental health professionals out of Ann Arbor, most of them out of a public university hospital, well known in the state of Michigan, um, really do think that the, the, the risks certainly don't outweigh the benefits at this point in time for most of us. So as we move forward, is it acceptable um, for us to consider you know, no harm, no follow. Follow if you want to participate or think you need to participate via online. You can do that, but let's start to meet in person, um, and then really have that as a basic, reasonable policy as we move forward. So, can we do that as a board? Make decisions like that as a board, or shall we be bringing this to the legislative body as a reasonable consideration, given all things considered from the last year, essentially? There have been a number of bills introduced to um, to affect the current law that ends the, um, the the virtual meeting for public bodies at the end of this month. Um, Senate Bill 207 was just introduced by Senator Schmidt that extends that deadline to the end of June. Um, there's also a bill to um, extend to allow for virtual meetings for every public body except those that are that are elected statewide, which I think there are four of those. One is this body and the other three are the universe, the three university bodies whose boards are, are elected statewide. Um, that's kind of a selective bill, it seems like. Um, so those th there's legislation that's been introduced. I don't know what discussions are being made or, or happening in the legislative leadership to address this, but you know we are what two, three weeks away from the end of this current um, deadline and I expect that they will act in their last two weeks of uh, session before their break to take action on something. So and, and the first one you talked about is, is simply just a bill that is associated with the pandemic, right? Is that that's the one that goes through July, correct? It would extend it through July. June 30th, I think, yes. June yeah, 30th. It, okay. it just pushes the deadline back or forward, however you want to look okay. at that. And then the second um, portion of that, the, the second, I think you said Representative Schmidt is, is um, referring to what what was the second? No, that was the Schmidt. Introduced? That was the Schmidt bill. There's another okay. bill. I don't, I don't have the number in front of me now, but that would allow for virtual meetings of public bodies except for for except for anybody that is is elected statewide, which of course is the, okay. the State Board of Education, MSU Board of Trustees, the U of M Board of Regents, and the Wayne State Board of Governors. Those four bodies are voted yeah. statewide. Do you have any sense why there's that, why that that would be, it would be for other elected bodies or public bodies, but not us? Mm, no, I'd hate to presume that I know the, <laughs> the reason behind that. I just, well, I'm not, not sure like if there's been discussion. Um, so what what would you recommend as the next step for um, encouraging this as we move forward? Well, <laughs> depending what you're asking me to make an opinion on this, and um, I think that we should push it back. I think the, the, the legislature should push back the date beyond the end of March that, because I don't think based on the on the on the numbers that we're seeing, even though the the numbers are 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 
declining as far as cases and, and deaths. I think we're heading in the right direction according to the governor's numbers and the DHHS numbers. I don't think this pandemic will be over uh, soon. I th uh, st all state employees have uh, been told to um, continue to work from home until May 1st. So there's that. So I think that the that the health experts um, don't expect an opening, you know, a complete opening until after March, the end of March. OK, so there's that, but then there's the concept of, again, the, the one thing that won't change even when we're outside of the pandemic is the idea that um, people with low immune systems are at risk when they're um, introduced to viruses and bacteria, period. So my curiosity is what what type of representative would you think, and I should say what type or who specifically, what committee or what individuals do you think would be helpful for us to reach out to to have that discussion? Uh, those are um, general government issues that, well, let me find the, uh, and maybe you can think about it if we can. So, we can so there's a, yeah, the government operations. Yeah, the government operations committee is where this bill, where these bills go in the House and the Senate. Um, I think what you're bringing up is are public health issues, um, which existed pre pandemic as well. I mean, people still, you know, had those conditions prior to the pandemic, um, and they weren't reflected in the Open Meetings Act back then. Right, and I, I definitely think our response at this point in time sort of honors uh, reality that we that we talk about how we how we address it moving forward. Because um, even if the numbers could, you know, continue to go in a certain direction and on a certain timeline and the pandemic lifts, that reality for those people will not. It'll still be there. Yeah, maybe it's always you know, I'd have to check the Open Meetings Act to see if there's always an option for people to participate virtually if people can if, right. if people can you know watch the meetings online or if they can even offer um offer offer public comment i think ellen has a comment well i think i think dr pew has one and then ellen okay. um, i'm sorry in, in order in the chat yeah I'm dr sorry. pew I'll, I'll yield to ellen because i think that she okay. probably Ms. Lip, Ms. and then dr pew Yes, under the current statute that was signed into law, uh, I believe at the end of last year, um, the um, the uh, boards um, are to meet remotely through the end of March. Um, they must provide a remote option to attend for anyone with a health condition through the end of the year. So that goes through under the current statute to the current law through the end of December. Um, and it just says evidence of a health condition um, through the end of December. And then the current law also uh, allows for people that are deployed, military people deployed overseas to have um, accommodation in perpetuity. So that is the current state of the law. It appears that some of these bills are um, intended to amend the length of time for uh, remote meetings for people who A, do not have a health condition or B, are not deployed overseas. Thank you. So I guess, my comments are, and I know that this is this is really hard stuff to comprehend. And I was just mentioning that um, earlier. And I think Do uh, Dr. Rice, you also mentioned um, that those of us who are public health people, you know, we don't look at this as a policy issue. We really do look at this from a science perspective. And um, as much as I love you. Uh, Marty, and I think that you are brilliant. <laughs> You're not one of those people that I would depend on to answer the questions that you were just asked. Um, you know, as far as what the legislature is looking at doing, yes, but as far as what we should be doing, uh, right. no. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's a lot of things to be taking into consideration here. Again, 
uh, you know, 60 million deaths per day is a lot of death, you know, that's due to this virus. I think that was the last number that I saw. Um, I've heard Dr. Fauci and others say, you know, we would like to see something at least around 10 million. Of course, you'll want to see it at zero. We're not gone from this uh, uh, disease. I mean, Dr. Rice talked about the map that he looked at a year ago and how there's such a stark difference in and where we were then and where we are today. So there's this issue of, yes, we want people to get vaccinated and we've got to get the supply first and we've got to get it distributed. And then, you know, we've, we have to build up immunity to this disease. That, that, I'm talking about this disease. I'm not talking about the ones to come. I'm talking about this one that we're dealing with right now. And it is uh, mutating. And there are various mutations that we're up against time. And I know you all have heard this over and over again, but I, I just want to say it on the record. But we are up against time to get people immunized using the safest means possible, which is inoculation through the, through vac vaccination and um, and do that before it mutates. And then we don't know if the current vaccine that we have right now, the three that we have right now, will be uh, successful in doing that. So it's not just I'm healthy, you're healthy, but but we can carry um, the disease uh, elsewhere. You know, so there there's many things that we have to look at uh, as we talk about um, going back to normalcy. As much as I would love to see you all and get those great lunches and have great conversations, and um, I am a people person, and so I look forward to that. But I think that there's a lot that we have to to look at, and um, I just have a question, a couple of questions, more questions. If we're moving off of this, if we're open for other bills. Well, uh, I, I believe we are. I think we've probably exhausted this particular issue. Um, hearing and seeing no in additional interests, uh, Dr. Pugh, back to you. Um, there was, uh, okay, so there's the bill. I can't remember if we talked about this the last time, but to regionalize the State Board of Ed, maybe we talked about that, you know, what what's going on with that. Um, I kind of like lost track of that. And then um, there was one more. There, there was another, oh, if there's any movement on any of the building safety, uh, like the water or anything like that, bills for schools. And then there was also a board that was created by the governor. And I don't think that we talked about that, that was education related. Um, and I don't remember what the name was. So those were just three things that that I was just wondering if we have any insight on. The building bills, I, I don't believe that they have gotten any traction yet. Yet, um, The state board um, bill has had hearings. Um, I'd have to check and see if it has moved. It may have moved out of committee, um, but that requires the political parties. I um, mean, it's a rotating every every two years. There, I think there are six uh, regions in the state um, and every two years the parties would be required to nominate uh, State Board of Education um, candidates from around the state. Uh, so that that's where the, that's what that bill does. Um, I still can't believe that the political parties would want to restrict themselves like that. Um, but that's a bill that that is, you know, getting some hearings anyway. Um, and then um, the third one was, I can't, I'm sorry, Pam, I didn't get that down. It was an education related board that oh. was created by the governor and I didn't know if Brandy, yeah. uh, Brandy's probably not here uh, back yet or here, but I can't even remember what the board, what the board was. And I don't know if anyone else does, but I, I can. It was an advisory board, an advisory commission, I think is what it was. I think it was to help schools help help um, understand how to get schools back into school, how to return to school. Okay. And I My, don't know. I don't. I don't know what where that where that group is, where that commission is, and in, in their in their acts. Okay. And my my questions, follow up questions to the two things that you just mentioned is, you know, just 
you know, if we do get more information, how do we give input or make sure that we have a closed loop on that? Um, I, I can't recall if I saw anybody from Michigan Department of Education or this board that was a part participant in that uh, board, that body, and then the um, regionalization of, of the board. I mean, if there's any, you know, as, as things, you know, if they progress, however they progress, if we could just get input on how, how that, how that's moving. Okay. I see so our legislative case on Go yeah, ahead, Dr. So, no, so a couple of things. First of all, we can talk about the uh, regionalization bill in um, in legislative committee. We'll give you an update pre-legislative committee. So we will share an update with you in the next board brief on that uh, on that piece. There's a lot of there there. Uh, it's very interesting um, and I'd like to do it justice. So we will be sharing with you, something with you and then following it up with a discussion in legislative committee. Relative to the uh, Student Recovery uh, Advisory Council, uh, Kyle Garant is our representative to that, um, to that council. Um, it is currently meeting. There are seven subgroups associated with it. I will tell you that um, uh, there is, um, I can't name a major education association that isn't currently engaged in some revisioning activity or another at the current moment. Uh, MDE itself has two groups working on this. The one group um, we're going to meet with tomorrow. The second group um, is all of the ed org executive directors and um, so we meet with the one group one week, the other group the next week. So we've got two revisioning exercises going on, if you will. Others have their own revisioning exercises and you point out an important revisioning exercise um, for which Kyle is our, um, is our representative. Yeah. Bet. Mas preguntas, more questions? No, once, twice, thrice. OK, um, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ackley, stay with us for the uh, for the for the late show. Uh, <laughs> Chairperson Lipton, do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, uh, I uh, thought it would be helpful once again to highlight some of the bills um, that relate to our strategic plan. Um, uh, and just to make you all aware um, of the bills that that I believe are particularly related to the strategic plan, which again is the um, really uh, amazing roadmap and just amazing work that uh, this board did um, in in putting that together uh, uh, with not just vision but also with um, metrics by which to be measured. Um, so I will just uh, highlight just a couple um, uh, in a in a very robust group of bills that have been introduced and referred to the Education Committee. Um, primarily, uh, H bill, uh, HB 4156 um, would establish a minimum number of school counselors to be employed by a school district, ISD or PSA. Um, which, of course, um, relates to the metric pertaining to um, improvement of social and emotional well-being of students. Um, HB 4167, uh, requiring annual inspections of all public and non-public schools for health and safety violations. Uh, same, uh, same, um, same uh, metric. Uh, HB 4310, 4311. Um, suspending the administration of the Michigan Merit Exam as a requirement for school aid funding for the uh, 2021 year only. Um, that, of course, uh, aligns with the resolution that uh, that we passed uh, uh, earlier uh, today. Um, uh, House Joint Resolution C uh, that uh, was um, uh, put forth by a representative Hornberger 
uh, chair of the House Education Committee, uh, amendment to the state constitution to eliminate the State Board of Education, the superintendent of public instruction, and the state board for public community and junior colleges, um, and would replace those bodies with a director uh, for the Michigan Department of Education uh, to be appointed by the governor. Uh, Senate Bill 121, uh, introduced by Senator McBroom. Um, parenthetically, I will add that this is uh, a similar bill. Uh, it's the exact same bill um, that uh, Senator McBroom offered when um, he was over in the House uh, and uh, myself and uh, Board Member McMillan served with him. Uh, require members of the State Board of Education to be nominated by regions but elected and serving statewide. Uh, I think I may have mentioned in an earlier uh, that many bills get reintroduced and certainly taken over from the House to the Senate, particularly when a member uh, switches between bodies. Uh, Senate Bill 184, a uh, bill to provide for clean drinking water in schools and child care centers. Uh, same um, uh, prong of the strategic plan as uh, uh, the earlier ones I discussed, health and well-being of students. And finally, Senate, con Senate Concurrent Resolution 5 um, to urge the U.S. Department of Education to grant waivers for state assessment requirements under the Every Student Succeeds Act. So those are just a highlights of uh, bills that are have been introduced um, that uh, either pertain to the functioning of this body, um, but more importantly, those that pertain to the prongs of our strategic plan. Thank you. Any uh, any reflections on the chairperson's uh, report? Thank you, uh, Chairperson Lipton. If we could pivot to um, Dr. Pritchett for uh, the NASB report. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, Dr. Albrecht already mentioned um, we are also on the subcommittee of NASB. Uh, the Public Education Policies Group, and um, they have broken up into four subcommittees uh, where we will be looking at some research and making some recommendations to NASB as a whole, uh, which will be taken up in October at their fall conference. Um, those four subcommittees are Digital Equity and Access, Racial Equity, Addressing Learning Loss Through Acceleration, and social and emotional learning. So um, we're in small groups uh, looking at those issues and we'll uh, provide some um, draft policy statements that again will be taken to the whole body. Uh, just a couple of reminders, NASB does have what they call office hours once a month. Uh, it's an hour. It's You can either join by Zoom or join by phone. That is this Thursday at three o'clock. It's usually on a Thursday. Um, what is this? The second Thursday of the month. So it's pretty regular. Um, and the purpose is to bring you up to date on federal legislation. So uh, and you can ask questions, etc. Uh, and then the NASB Legislative Conference is 21st and 22nd of this month. Also, uh, I am currently registered and I believe Ellen has registered also for that conference, which is obviously virtual. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Any report, any um, uh, reflections on Dr. Pritchett's report? It is a day of reflections. We are, a, we are a board of mirrors, hearing and seeing none. Uh, we are at that point in our uh, board agenda with comments for comments by State Board of Education uh, members. Um, you could Put your interest in comments in the chat. You may be all commented out. If so, that's OK. Ms. Tilly, a comment. Yes, a point of, of clarification. Um, you know, there, <laughs> there seems to be nasty and offensive 
things said at, at each meeting, and this one was no different. Um, but the point of clarification, Dr. Rice does not lead the board. He leads MDE. President Albridge leads the board. And none of us need to be managed. We are all elected officials. We all are here for duty, hopefully. <laughs> We are, are, are all here on behalf of the children and trying to improve education in the state of Michigan in our own way. So please, enough with the disrespectful comments every meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Anyone else um, care for a board member comment? Hearing and seeing, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Pugh. If I have a comment, but questions. Is there any way, um, Dr. Rice, and um, I guess I could I could email it over that we can look at like how districts are, like what's going on in the schools? Can we get that information as it relates to COVID as as the the reopening? I'm thinking, and and in particular, our uh, partnership districts because there was a report that came out um, like how is testing going on in those schools? Um, I know from educators, I, I, I don't know if I report it here, but I did he have an opportunity to talk to a group of educators where schools had already been open. So some of the schools that have been open since, you know, the first time that they could open and most of them, none of them were, were the partnership districts and they were concerned themselves about keeping the three feet of distance. And so they were really concerned about other districts uh, once the March 1st hit, if that was gonna be able to be maintained by districts who had less capability, meaning more students, um, maybe even less space to store items in their classrooms because the classrooms needed to be cleared out. Um, but I, I would just like to see how that's working. Is, is the distancing able to be maintained? Um, what are we doing with the funding that was allotted to just uh, uh, assess the ventilation? Um, is that funding being utilized? And if it's being utilized, once the findings are made, is it? Um, are they being able to? Are they able then able to address those issues? Um, so just a, a better pulse on what's going on out there as we are seeing more schools uh, opening okay, at a time that we just don't know what, what you know what what direction we're going to go in. Sure. So let me let me just contextualize that. Um, let me begin with the fact that we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Pearson, our interim deputy superintendent, director of the Office of Partnership uh, Districts and our interim director of the Office of Partnership Districts, Ms. Gloria Chapman, in May. So we, we do have that slated. Uh, they will be coming forward. They will be able to share a little bit at that moment. Know that of the 832 LEAs across the state, the 832 local education agencies across the state, most of them have been open for a good part of the year. They are not necessarily the largest of districts, um, but most of our districts have been open. The The November, December period um, was, a, was certainly a, um, a change. But if you look at the EPIC MSU reports, which we've shared with you, you can see a gradual, you, you can see an increase in the percentage of in-person options available up to and through the beginning of November, a dissipation in the middle to end of uh, November into December, and then a reinflation of that percentage, January, February, and we'll get March data um, in a week and a half. Okay. What we know from last month is that 83% of our districts in March we're, we're offering an in-person option, five-sixths. And that's roughly what we were at um, in the fall, pre-second or third wave that shut all of the high schools down for four weeks. So know that for a lot of districts, often very small, 
they've had that in-person option from the beginning of the year. What we're seeing now is more and more larger districts, more and more larger suburban, more and more larger urban that are offering an in-person option. So that that is changing um, what's going on. Moreover, we're having more parents who feel more comfortable sending their children back, right? In other words, um, they themselves have been vaccinated. Their, their parents, the children's grandparents have been vaccinated. Um, they feel more comfortable after several months at a distance. So we are seeing a reinflation, um, but we still have a good percentage of our young people who are being educated virtually. And I would uh, submit to you that it will, it is likely that a good percentage will continue to be educated at a distance through the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. Now that said, we'd be happy to talk with you a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. um, we could certainly have Catherine Strunk from Epic MSU come and share uh, what has happened with the, the initial rise, the subsequent decline, and the re-rise of those percentages, share with you um, how the fact that a district is open and the fact that children are going to school in the district are two different things in person. So for example, Detroit was open from jump, but you had approximately one quarter of its children in person and about three quarters virtually so that a district is open and that the children are going to school a difference. But if you have an interest in Epic MSU coming, uh, they've done some really fine work in the data analysis. We would welcome them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that that would be instructive for the board. With respect to ventilation, I can tell you that um, none of the ESSER two money has been used for ventilation yet because it hasn't been distributed yet. It hasn't been distributed yet because it hasn't been allocated by the state legislature. It's that, that whole conversation that we had this morning and then subsequently that, that, um, that we had with Mr. Ackley a few minutes ago. Um, that's different from whether MDHHS has been active in this space. It has, it's different from whether dozens of districts haven't taken MDHHS up on uh, the Department of Health and Human Services offer to assess the facilities. But as we've talked, Dr. Pugh, you can assess, that's good, but beyond the assessment, it's important to get a reflection on, uh, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. I mean, I may know I need a new mechanical system. That's different from be having the wherewithal to put in place a new mechanical system. That's to the ESSER two funds, number one. That's to school funding that is a little bit more equitable, number two. I mean, I, I started my career in a district where I sloshed from one part of the building to the other. The, the, when I say sloshed, I wasn't sloshed um, and I wasn't educating children outdoors. I was indoors but we had a bad roof and when it rained, it didn't just rain outside, it rained in a portion of the building right. too. You know, that was Washington DC public schools back in the day, but we have districts in the state, they don't have a source of capital funding for their capital needs. In other words, they don't have a sinking fund, they don't have a, um, a, a, a capital millage and as a result, they're left to try to provide for their buildings through their um, inad inadequate operating budget. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to ask MDHHS back to talk specifically about ventilation mm -hmm. because and I do think that's an important area. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that the, present, the presenters um, last month laid out very well that we are talking about two different tales. They were very clear on that, um, that while there is guidance that's put out there, having the wherewithal uh, to, to follow that guidance, it comes with so many layers of barriers. 
and um, the health of our children have long been dependent upon this and the success. But now um, where they're looking to return to those buildings and they they probably are not in all of the statistics that we're seeing, but we do know that the data that I have most readily available to me shows that the children who do have the um, the greatest impact, uh, um, adverse impact to COVID, 78% uh, of those who die from COVID of children, um, you know, are those of color. And if we're putting them back into the schools, um, then we need to really be able to monitor what's going very closely, what's going on. And if we look at our data too, we see that there's a high percentage of, of black children who have um, the adverse effects and have, have the underlying issues that would that would also um, make them more susceptible to having adverse effects to, to COVID. Um, so I, I just would appreciate as we are looking to move in this direction um, that, that we are really making sure that we're uh, dissecting that information as, as best as, as we can. The, the um, exposure risk or the things that will put us at greater, our children at greater exposure and then like any, any health um, indicators that, that we could look at as well. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing that with us. We will, um, as we debrief this board meeting and plan for next, we'll take that into consideration. I appreciate it. Um, I do want to point out Ms. Soper's comment, if, if I could, in the chat. Um, our Region 8 Teacher of the Year, she notes that um, we in Jackson have been face to face since the beginning. I, I, don't, I don't think she's going back to the garden, um, but probably the beginning of the school year. Um, except for November slash December, except for that four four week period of um, of time. So that that is helpful mm -hmm. perspective. And I, I think that actually from a district perspective, that really is the rule. It's not the exception. It's the rule. Now, from a kid perspective, that's different because while a significant majority of our districts have been in session most of the year, that's different from where a majority of our children have been educated. A yes. majority of our children have been educated mm -hmm. remotely, mm -hmm. while a majority of our districts have been have been open uh, with an in-person option as well as the virtual option also. And I'll just say, and I don't think that there's clarity around that, number one. Number two, I'll, I'll just say again is that um, I m met with um, some educators from across the state and they just asked to meet. I didn't know what we were going to be going to be meeting about. Um, they were from rural districts, suburban districts, and they had concerns about the move towards opening um, all school districts. Uh, just based on some of the things that that they saw, you know, one of the things that they did want to make sure of that we knew is that children, even children who are uh, being uh, taught at a distance, um, virtually are learning, and that the teachers are working very hard to make sure that our children are, are learning and they are seeing skills being developed in a neat way. No, but but they are seeing. Uh, skills and, and learning occurring. Um, so to to um, to our teachers' point of view, I, I did appreciate hearing from those districts and just hearing about what what some of their their concerns were um, and what some uh, bus drivers. You know, they talked about buses and you know keeping buses clean. The extra time that that it take, takes for that. They talked about uh, children with special needs and the para pros and folks who have to care for those children. Um, and oftentimes they, they're caring for children who, who couldn't wear masks. So there were several concerns that they brought up, but I did appreciate those educators bringing up those different points that we should look at, you know, as there is this push to, to provide in-person education. Right, I think, I think that we do, it is important to distinguish between schools open for an in-person option and parents availing themselves of that option. I believe that the uh, push over the last two months to open up for in-person option 
is not necessarily going to change the percentages of children in districts that have been open the last six or seven months, but for that four week period in November, December. What will change parents' minds in those districts that have had in-person options for the most part for the last six or seven months, what will change their mind is a sense that number one, lots of people are being vaccinated. Number two, people are taking mitigation strategies seriously. Number three, there is proper ventilation. Number four, the schools have thought through all of the contingencies, all of the ways to approach children. Number five, the issue around spacing that um, ideally you're able to maintain that six feet of social distancing, um, but that if you're not, you do the you do the very, very best you can and that minimally you are you are masked, uh, you are hand washing, you are disinfecting, you are working on the the airflow as as well. I think as parents reflect upon this, it's not so much is the district next to me open? It's rather what's my district doing that gives me confidence or or not? I can tell you that the vast majority of the districts have been open most of the year. But the largest districts, not necessarily, Detroit an exception, of course, um, many of the largest districts not, and even with some of the larger suburban and urbans, there's a reluctance on the part of many parents to go back. But as these vaccinations go into 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, we're over 2.6 million now today, as they continue to grow, I believe all else being equal, there'll be increased confidence in the ability to go back. Uh, but that, But that all else being equal is important. That means you don't take your masks off. You don't start um, pretending this is pre-pandemic with respect to space. You don't let up on uh, ventilation and hand washing and disinfecting and, and, and. Those mitigation strategies are going to be with us for a period of time, not because we're skittish, but because we are following the advice of public health officials and the CDC. Um, Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Ms. Lipton? Yes, I just had a quick question. Um, the, uh, the the majority of the um, uh, federal dollars um, that will be coming to schools, um, they would be most, most effectively spent in one-time projects, correct? Um, I, since it's one-time dollars? Say, yeah, so, so it's a good question. Um, it's a little bit of a Zen question. Let, let me give you let me give you two quick answers to it. The first answer is yes. Not non-recurring uses of non-recurring dollars should be spent on non-recurring activities. Okay. That said, you can imagine some non-recurring uses of staff. In other words, mm. if you were to say. Right we want to extend the school year by 10 days um, okay. for one year and we're, we're going to pivot back after that that's non-recurring it's in staff yes but but it would be non-recurring a boiler a chiller changing in windows there are there are school districts across the state as you may know you may not but there are school districts whose windows do not open reflect upon this so their ability to get uh, good cross ventilation in in the you know in the spring and in the fall is non-existent. There are many districts that don't have air conditioning. Um, they have old HV systems, old heating and ventilation systems, no AC. So it's an HV system, not an HVAC system. So all of those are one-time projects that you could imagine one-time uses of funds. Um, on, but but tutoring could be one time for a year. Uh, additional tutoring, additional mentoring, um, additional summer school, um, additional literacy supports, additional numeracy supports, additional time. All of those would be 
um, appropriate one uh, or non-recurring expenditures. Yeah. yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, anything more for the good of the group under state board comments? Hearing none, future meeting dates are Tuesday, April 13th, Tuesday, May 11th, Tuesday, May 18th, all at 930. The first two are regular meetings. The third is a work session. If there are any topics uh, board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify Marilyn or me. The time is now uh, 318. Let no one say we don't give you something back when you come to a state board meeting. Enjoy your extra time. Thank you, board members. Have a good day.